so if this is your first time watching I want to say welcome um, and if this is uh, you returning just to follow along with the channel I want to say welcome back and thank you so today's a little fun project because we're jumping off the the stock SB220 build I've got a customer a good friend of mine coming to town and he requested something and he was willing to pay for it now I built this, this setup here, um, five and a half, six years ago now. And this is my daily station. This is my daily station. And I've had two customers request this. I've got one that's in the pipeline to have a big box built and another one, which is coming up now, um, to get his big box installed. I don't do installs very often. It's incredibly expensive when I do do them because everything's got to be perfect and no half-assery going on. So, Anyhow, this gentleman wants me to recreate my meters on my station and I said, I can't do that. And he goes, why? And I said, because I built those for me. But what I can do is I can build you something a little bit better because since when we put this together almost a half decade ago or over a half decade ago now um, learned a couple things and we're going to do a couple really cool things so the first thing you got to do is you got to get on the inner boob and you got to go hunting because these things are getting a little bit harder and harder and harder to find now, I'm not going to lie, when I built my setup, I spent, I think, $1,800. But it took me two years to accumulate the parts. Okay? This setup, the guy wants it now, and he wants it right now. I did not know that each one of these actual Bird 43 meters, not Watts Electronics copy knockoff reprinted Chinesium meters, no offense to the guys at Watts, they're just not legit bird meters. There's people out there that'll say, Whew. they're exactly the same. What you carrying on about, Willis? <laughs> I've been like, they ain't the same. That's what I'm carrying on about, Willis. Okay, each one of those meters, um, certified actual bird meters, is about 170 something dollars a piece, just the elements, right? And then on top of that, we got our cabinet, which is made of three pieces. Our faceplate unit, the lid, and the back plate. Back plate. Okay. In there, got to add a peak kit. Might as well just be counting off $200 bills. Two, four, six, eight, ten, plus one more that isn't here yet. There's $1,200 there. But now we're going to times that by two. And I'm going to show you what we're going to do different between my setup and his setup. I like how mine looks. I like how this looks even better, to be honest with you. And um, that's the way a lot of the guys on the internet have been mounting them. But we're going to add a different twist to it, a little bit different twist. So mine is mounted like this on the outside. So they call slip through installation looks just like this. I like that look. Now, that's just me. First time I seen these assembled was uh, in a guy's truck here in town. And I was like, wow, that's kind of neat. And he's like, oh, but it's super expensive. You'll never afford that. And I was like, okay, give me time. Little did they know, the giant, 
that it was being ready to be unleashed upon Idaho. So, we go forward a little bit, and I build mine. And I love mine, mine work great. But, instead of just copying, I want to make it better and different. So, if we notice, these aren't set in here flush. So what I mean by that is I could take this meter and do like everybody else on the inner boob has been doing. They just mount them up flush. And that looks really slick and professional and nice and cool. Yes, they all say through line on them, by the way. These are recessed. And you're going to see why here in a little bit. See, flush, recessed. So a little bit of light. That's what we're wanting to capitalize on. So, now let's add lights, but the BBI way. <laughs> You'll see. So here's where we're at with this. How about the base, base, b -b 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 base, 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 b -b 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 base. How about the base? Let the beat drop, 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 drop. So this is a one million color LED strip system, which uses the red, the green, and the blue colors of the spectrum to make yellow, uh, chartreuse, violet, pink if you want it, purple, green, and orange, or white. And then you can change the intensity anywhere you want it. And it's all done via wireless remote. So we did this with all the meters internally as well. I've yet to wire those in, but got all the meters pre-wired. Got the peak kit in, um, got to install an overall master on off switch because RF has a tendency to do some weird things. So I wanted him, him to be able to kill the thing other than the wireless remote. Like I built this into Vader and it worked fine when I was on the 15, but I want it 40,000, a whole lot more horsepower. The thing would sit there and strobe through colors over and over and over and over again. So this is a nightmare to wire and what we're wanting to do is we're going to backlight each meter from behind its panel, but then we're going to also backlight all the way around the edges. Okay? Because we figured out that there's only three, three LED pads inside each meter. <clears throat> now, when I did this for myself, there was like 20 inside of each meter. That was because the padding was different. So, it's just a cool effect. I was going to backset the meters and backlight them anyhow but this will actually add more light to the meter panel itself. And the idea is that this can sit up on this guy's dash and he can punch up on. He can punch up anything he wants. Let's make it go through all of its functions here real quick. He can punch up anything he wants and he can punch up any brightness that he wants. So when he's driving down the road in the middle of the night, he's not making himself blind. Because some colors are really harsh on the eyes at night, especially if you're a truck driver, like blue, green, or red's the easiest thing for your eye to recover from. At least that's according to the military I studied once when I was a kid. Hence the reason they've got red lights in most helicopters and that kind of stuff, and aircraft. And... But, uh, yeah. It goes into some really cool strobing effect here in a second. And I'm not the first one to do this, not by far. There's lots and lots of guys out there that have done all different kinds of backlighting, but uh, I think I'm the back first one to do the cabinet backlight and do the... That's cool. At least the way it looks on the camera. You can see, just because of the way the, the shutter speed is, that this is the last one to get the signal with the shutter speed on the camera. 
Imagine seeing that going down the road. Look at that. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Most of the time this will be in a constant color. Like yellow, blue green, red, dark green, red amber. Now I can't make any guarantees on how well this is going to work for him. As far as RF get not getting into the thing, but we're going to add chokes and filters and all kinds of stuff. Come on down. Let's go on down. Intensity on down. The first person that gave me this idea was a gentleman by the name of William Cunningham. William is a very custom upholster shop in California. I did some work for him. Nice guy. Super got nice guy. And as a thank you gift for doing the work on his amps, he's the one that created the shadow box logo that we have here in the shop. And this one also does like 10 million colors or 1 million colors or whatever craziness you want to talk about. So we'll see how well this works out. Now, what I want to do is I want to wire up one of the three light panels and get it tied in and then we're going to test it. And then I got to build a plug to go between the two meter panels to feed back to the main source unit. Give me time. It's coming together, slow but sure. So here we are. I'm going to start on this about 830 this morning. It is now midnight. And this is for a three dual line section setup. And um, how this all works is there is an infrared pickup right here in the front of the meter. So this is your master off switch, master on switch. This is your multiplier, so one, two, five times. This is peak on, peak off switch, which we don't have the nine volt in there right now. But the cool thing about this set is it is sound activated if you wanted it, which kind of makes it like disco, I guess. And then you got the fast strobe. Bertha butt boogie boogie boogie. Ba da 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 dum bum bum ba dum ba dum bum bum. Now, if we look real close, it's like I was saying, the meters are recessed. Whoop, 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 whoop. So all the way around the edge, there's also light that's coming in from the inside of the cabinet. There's LED strip down here on the bottom of the cabinet and two LED strips on the back shining forward. So it's double lit. You have the lights inside the bird meter and then you have the recessed backlighting. That's their version of white, right there, which kind of looks bluish. I'm not the only one that thinks so. That's their version of yellow. That's their version of blue. That's their version of purple. That's supposedly pink. That's a dark purple. That's green. And that's their version of yellow. That's their version of red, green, and blue. It is dimmable. Fully up. Then fully down. Which I think is pretty neat. Then you got the display mode. which you can crank this thing up to the point where it gives you a seizure. But we don't have all the coaxes run yet. This is going in a mobile install. So this is your forward reflect power 
from your radio. So this line section will sit right behind the radio. So a little coax jumper goes off, goes to the radio. Then we'll have a five watt slug in the reflect position, which will be here, otherwise right here. We'll say this is the radio. Five watt slug reflect. 25 watt slug in forward and average. Then over here, this sits between the driver and the big box, 25 watt slug and reflect, 1000 watt forward and RMS. And then on the big line section down here, we'll have a 100 watt reflect slug from the antenna and a 5000 watt slug in the forward position. Now the multiplier, you can make this read <clears throat> 5000, 10,000 or 25,000 off one element which is the reason we want with a 25 watt slug. Now on the back, how they're linked together is with just a nice four pin jack. Just works off a four pin mic jack setup. This is incredibly expensive, you guys. I've only built maybe four or five sets of these because a lot of guys, they don't want to spend the money on it. They don't see that it's really necessary. Where me, myself, I would freaking lose it if I couldn't see everything going on all the time. Like if I couldn't see the forward and reflect between my radio and my amp, I'd lose my mind. And the forward and reflect between the driver and the big box, I'd lose my mind. Because you can have problems at all of these different stages. And there's people out there that run one bird meter. All they care about is the forward. Oh, look, it's, it's transmitting great. But then when you have a high amount of reflect, you can't see it because it's only going to show you forward. I want to be able to see it all, all the time. Now, what I've got on my own personal station is, well, basically this whole setup, except I don't have the multicolor LEDs in it. And honestly, most of the time, I just leave them off. And mine aren't recessed. They sit on the outside. I always liked it, and it looked better that way to me. But to reset them like this and then actually recess them back in, no trimming. It's just the way they come. Now inside of here, like I said, we got multiple LED strips. And I put these all together. There's LEDs inside the actual meters themselves, but it was so dark that I couldn't see it. And I wasn't very happy with that. So I had to go and add extra LED cobs on the top. But like I was saying, bump bump ba da dump ba dum bump bump ba da 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 dum. That's pretty disco, and I'm not a big fan of disco. But what I am a big fan of is him being able to have light to see what he's doing when he's talking as he's running down the road. And he can set it up any color he wants. That's his favorite color. It's a it's supposed blue green. It looks just like the striker radio. It's going to match his striker radio. That's what's going to make him happy. So I got to put labels on all of this, and then we got to run all the coaxes. But this is just part one. I'm going to continue on with this video, but we got to do the install first. So for us to make all this work, we've got to change out his alternator. We got to go to a big alternator, like a 350 amp continuous alternator with an external regulator unit. Um, add an extra battery, add three super capacitors, and which is just in one unit. So one extra battery, 350 amp alternator, whole bunch of four gate or four out wire, um, bunch of new grounds, change out all those coax, and then run remote cables from the line sections for each one of the sections of meters from the appropriate locations all the way back to these units, then solder them in. And then when we get that done, then we can accuratize our bird or peak meter over here. And then we'll get the nine volter put in play. So until tomorrow, we shall return. Okay, so I'm on the scratch microphone on the little Handycam in 4K here. And this turned into a, uh, let's brag about our watt meters that we're building for this guy to, I'm gonna show you guys a full install. And we've been hydraulically crimping and submerged soldering eyelets because some of the limitations of this install have got us to where 
we got to make sure we squeeze every little drop of electrical jizz out of the two wires we got that we can get so let me uh let me take outside here for a minute okay so we're outside now and uh that's the Lease Neville 320, 25 amp, whatever it is, alternator that we just installed in the stock location. And we pulled the Delco Remy that was in there in a pile of junk. What was it, 160? 65. Yeah, 165. So when he's got all his lights on, his inverter running, and everything else, it's pulling continuous, like 80 amps. Well, that leaves like 40 amps literally like left over for him to run his radio stuff. So we went ahead and went to the biggest one that we could stuff into this pad mount hole without having to modify all the electrical harness on this side. Now we went with a variable voltage regulator, which is the L7-9000. Um, there's some pros and there's some cons to that. Um, this alternator and the field wire that comes off the back of it looks for a switched hot and then it needs what they call a tri-diode pack on the back which instead of buying a commercial one, I just put one together and built one. Um, it's just three diodes with the anodes facing to each other and uh, the cathodes attached to each one of the output legs of each one of the phases. And that's what drives um, this regulator. We undo this little bolt here, this little nylon nut, and that allows us to have access to the screws that set our voltage level. So now, I don't know about you guys, I'm gonna install Oh, I don't know, fifteen thousand dollars worth of radio crap. Why would I trust my ground that the the, the motor and the Volvo company? What, what size motor is this? Uh, D16 600. It's a six hundred amp horse. Yeah, penis extension. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't trust their wiring and their their crimp and their connections for nothing. So we went ahead and we created out of one aught, and we took the whole bracket apart and polished the metal in between the frame and the knot and clean this all up and then we cleared it. And the reason we clear it is because we want to stop any and all corrosion and right now, before I put all that down, we cleaned this all with electronic wash so I know there's no moisture underneath any of the joints and any of the fittings, anything. I'm sorry, it's stupid cold out here today. So we've got our power wire for our electrical system and our computer and you'd probably want to put some ferrite on this, which I got some for you, just in case it, we wait until we have a problem though. This is uh, your primary CAN bus plug-in. And then this is your computer harness right here. But the main computer that you get into is up in the cab. And if we have problems, we'll get into that later. But we just got running a, got done running our new positive lead from front to back. This is a dual hydraulic crimped, submerged, soldered, and epoxy based heat shrink. This is really important because this is going to be on a, in a high vibration environment. Um, there's two schools of thought that go with this. Me personally, I want the best electrical connection that we can get. You got to be very careful about how you solder this. Um, you can only solder up to the very edge of the eyelet. You do not want the solder to infiltrate into the wire past the eyelet. Otherwise, it can create a stiff point in the, in the, in the wire. And as the motor's sitting there vibrating for the next kajillion years, it could cause a break in this wire. So, like I said, we do a dual, dual hydraulic crimp here. And so in theory, if the crimp is done properly, the solder cannot migrate through the wire. So we submerge the eyelet just up to the edge of the, uh, well, we submerge the eyelet and solder just up to the edge of the eyelet. And then we make sure we don't let any solder run up the wire. So then after you get the submerging process done, you hang the wire upside down and let it cool down. Then to help mitigate that vibration issue at the joint, there is heat shrink, Teflon activated heat shrink that goes around the eyelet. And then on top of that, we've got two part epoxy based, thick RV marina grade heat shrink. And what that does is it bolsters the joint between the eyelet and the wire. So now this is as stiff as a coffin nail. So even if any solder was able to infiltrate through this wire, then we allow us to have a flex joint. Now, like I've said in the tips and tricks in the mobile installation, if you are gonna run an auxiliary hot wire, it has to be in some kind of protective jacket. Liquitite is my favorite form of, uh, is this me or is it starting to snow? snow? God damn, we have been, yeah, snow. We're getting our asses kicked with the cold. Now, if you were here last week, it would've been 65 degrees or 70. Ridiculous. 
like I said, the tips and the tricks in the mobile installation, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what I mean by that is if you don't put some kind of anti-abrasion shield on your power wire, it's not a matter of if your truck is gonna catch on fire and burn to the ground, it's a matter of when. Now, I took Alex here over the other day because we had to steal <laughs> The regulator that I bought was bad, so we stole this one off of my personal truck, which I'm only down to two alternators on it from six. But uh, I went over to storage, and you've seen the white Chevy, it needs a bath. Yeah. It's been storage for a long time, but that truck, what I used is a Ryobi vacuum cleaner hose. You know, the big thick hose? Mm -hmm. Because I had so many alternators, and I had so much wire I had to run from the front to the back, so all the wire was run through this big three inch vacuum cleaner hose from underneath the firewall all the way to the back of the, the bed and into the cab of the truck. You gotta have something that caught, that stops vibrate or stop, stops wear abrasion on the jacket because let's face it, this jacket coating is just about as soft as that first teenage girl and the tip of her tippy, nippy tippies. Right, and it's soft and delicate, okay. Because we run primarily unfused electrical systems, and we're wanting every little bit of drop of jizz that we can get out of this. This alternator is technically not big enough to fully support the load that we're gonna to apply to it, but we're gonna bolster its ability to do its job with super capacitors. So this is an uncut run that runs from here. And then we've got it falling along the harness going up underneath the, um, the body of the truck. And about every six to eight inches, we got a zip tie and it's supported and there's no rub points. And let me show you where it comes through the floor. So let's come back around here and let me talk about this for a hot second. So you, there's two schools of thought when it comes to running ground. You're gonna have your primary ground conductor and then you've gotta have a physical mechanical bond to ground. Well, these are our RF bonds that look like this, braid. And you can see where we've got it done in multiple spots on the truck. And over here on the door, we're abandoning this whole antenna setup. We're gonna go with something else. I'll show you that here in a minute, but inside the door, you bond in multiple spots. Big, flat braid. I don't care what anybody says. Um, like my buddy Tech9, love and respect that guy to death. He believes in flat, uh, round. He likes round wire. Me personally, I follow what I learned in the Motorola RF handbook, also what I followed in the ARL handbook, also what I followed in um, the, the book that I just finished reading called Reflections. These are all books that directly deal with the properties that come to do with RF. Your ground wire has to be substantial enough to equivalent two times the size of the surface conductor area of your coax because it's all about controlling the direction the ground or the counterpoise electrical potential of the antenna moves. This is an RF ground, not an electrical ground. Those are two separate things. So, we'll come back to that. The, if you're gonna ground, you gotta bond in multiple spots to a solid metal piece of material. It's gotta be cleaned off on both sides, the nut, and also on the jam portion. And then you wanna come back and re-clear everything. That way there's nothing that can get in here and make that connection corrode. We're going to go inside in a minute. We're getting ready to get snowed out. Okay, so back here on the back of the alternator, on the back of all East Neville's, you have two uh, major mount points. And on this particular alternator, that's where they're utilizing the ground hookup. On the smaller amp alternators, you'll see that they'll have a secondary ground post. Because this is in the 300 class range, that has been deleted and it goes directly just to the case. So we're wanting our electrical ground at this point. They've are, we've already bonded the motor with um, big, you know, one inch wide or better ground material in multiple spots. So like I was saying with the RF ground, you can use two one inch straps, but that one inch strap, if you think about it, when you bend it over in a circle, it's about the same size as like your 213 coax, your 393, your 217, that styles of coax that you guys are gonna run that are running higher power in the mobile, a little bit higher power. But your ground bond from your frame and your cab and your door, your reflective surfaces, your antenna, has to be at least two times the amount of total surface area as your coax size. This is our electrical connection ground. 
separate from our RF bond. Now, a lot of guys are gonna run a hot and a ground. Now, like in my white truck, which is primarily car stereo, to help avoid having ground loop issues, that means different ground potentials between different amplification stages in a car audio or audio chain, or multiple points of uh, isolated differentiation in ground, I ran a hot and a ground off of each alternator, back to the battery, back to the source, but also I ran um, three inch wide ground braid from one end of the frame to the other and then bonded everything about every six to 12 inches up and down the whole truck. Because remember, the more metal mass in a mobile you can put underneath the antenna that's flat at the same electrical potential gives you a larger reflective service, which means, guess what? You're going to transmit better. Okay. This is our electrical ground. Now we're going to utilize our frame. Instead of running a solid wire front to back, I want to utilize the frame to help bring the whole truck to the same electrical potential. Because remember, up there in the cab, we've got a radio. Over here behind the firewall, we're going to have our first stage driver. And then our big box is getting to sit in the back. So we have to make sure our ground potential, because remember electrons flow from ground to hot, not hot to ground. Everybody gets that backwards in their brains. We have to make sure that we have the shortest distance with the highest quality of ground through the most metal surface that we can provide. Frame. So before we jump up into the cab, this is our ground. Oh man, ah, I have to degrease that eyelet now. This is our ground potential for into the cab for the 24 pill that we're gonna install in here. Okay, so that comes right out of the floor because we're gonna install the 24 pill right behind the, this wall, right out of the floor and we're gonna bring it right back to the, the frame. Now our hot wire comes up through here and it's in loom and protected and zip tied and you wanna treat it like a little, well, once again, that first teenage girl that lets you play with her boobies. Gotta respect the nips. Gotta respect the nips. Okay, so now most sleepers that I've been in don't have this much access. This this tunnel usually goes all the way through and most Kenworths and stuff. And nice thing about the Volvo is they got this flip-up compartment, which is straight through to the floor. Um, it's the little details that are the most vitally important. Anytime you have a substantial power wire or any power wire pass through any metal body, you need to have something like a strain relief of some kind. Well, me personally, I don't think grommets are worth a shit. I freaking hate them. And especially with the quantity of current that we're going to put on this side of the wall. If he has a short issue that takes place back to the frame or ground potential, it's not just a small smoldering fire that slowly burns the truck together down. This thing explodes. So... So we can win, and we setting ourselves up for success. I use Haco connectors to go through the floor. This is nothing new. Everybody and their brother knows about Haco connectors. But it's the little details, like taking the time to take a hydraulic press and cut the holes through the carpet so they're perfectly round and they're all spaced out. And there's no dimpling in the carpet floor. But now back to the eyelet thing that I was just talking about and going off on. Um, it's depending on who you ask. <laughs> there are a lot of solar system guys, and I know a lot of them don't adhere to this. Like, I built the flagship station for the Vectron Nation install. If you go to Vectron, which is, in my opinion, the, uh, the industry leader in the solar system world, <laughs> yeah, uh, that got built right here. You go to their webpage, you'll see the, a picture of, well, the opening page to their web their website as well. My handiwork. I built it with my friend Nate and his beautiful wife, Heather. Um, but that's 99% me and all my cable routing and all that. So we built it as a team. I can't take sole credit for it and I never would even attempt it, but I get on these little solar system groups and they, they go off. They don't realize that they're giving themselves or giving up like 25% of the performance in their system because they, they firmly believe that if you solder an eyelid, it's going to break. <laughs> Stupid. I know, but they believe in it like it's, it's like Moses come down off Mount Carmel with the Ten Commandments. No, thou shall not solder eyelid anywhere ever. 
it will cause it to break from vibration. No, you mitigate that risk and you manage that flex. So, a lot of guys will just trim the wire back and they'll crimp it. I argue from the other side of the street. Any connection that is external has to be soldered. If you have the potential of that connection getting even remotely wet or being exposed to any kind of humidity, it has to be soldered. Because it's not, a, once again, it's a fact. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when that connection starts to corrode and then it loses its ability to conduct. Yeah. So we want this to work two or three years from now just the same way it did when we installed it. So um, we're going to stick the 24 pill in this. Let's get off that topic. I'm over it. I bitch about it in about every other video that I ever put out. <laughs> you guys in the DIY solar system group really upset me. They talk about non-listening to reason, trying to leave, believe in babble. I don't, anyhow. Um, they'll just do a crimp, a hydraulic crimp, and they claim if the connection is done properly, you don't need to do anything more than that. Well, we know for a fact it's a measurable difference of 30%. So if you want to throw that 30% of the electrical system out the window and wipe your butt with it like a child, you can or you can capitalize on it. So we're going to solder these up in here in a cab. Um, always leave your leads long. That way you can come back and cut as needed. But we are going to put a 1500 farad super capacitor up in here. So three 500 uh, farad caps, a 24 pill, a dual line section, um, maybe an auxiliary battery. The auxiliary battery I don't think we need. You've already got four batteries in this truck. Yeah, but they're at the opposite end of the electrical chain from here. But batteries don't do you ship for shine oil until the voltage drops to 12.5. So, I mean, they don't. Unless you are running a an 18 volt battery bank and running on a capacitance. So a lot of guys, what they'll do is they'll take a 12 volt and a six volt battery tie them in series to get 18 volts and then they'll charge at 20 and then when they go to key they'll use a very small alternator like a 150 amp or 200 amp alternator and they'll key and they run on just the capacities of the battery well it pulls the battery from you know because lead acid batteries aren't very efficient at doing their job um, they can only outrush a couple hundred amps um, it'll pull it down into the 16 volt range so you have you know, 12 plus 6, so you got an 18-volt battery, and it'll pull it down to about 16.5, which is safe for the Toshibas, but not so hot for the HGs or the HG2879Cs. It's not very smart. But the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, do we really want to stay with the lead-acid batteries that you have in this truck, or do we want to be progressively thinking about it and maybe thinking about doing, like, lithium phosphorus or lithium ion or some of the other lithium batteries where the, the resting voltage is at 14? Yeah, we might. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit of money, but it's a whole lot less maintenance. They're sealed. They have a lot higher duty cycle. They can outrush current almost as fast as the super capacitors. But I can't seem to find anybody who wants to jump onto that bandwagon with me at all. So it's a conversation you and I haven't had a chance to talk about off camera yet. But um, there's quite a few guys that have been experimenting with it. Um, some pros and some cons of those kind of batteries is... Uh, depending on what series of battery or style of battery you buy, you got to be looking at how they're charged, if they got balancing boards in between each one of the cells, if it's going to require a special management system for the batteries. There are certain batteries that will put out more current than what, I mean, you can inrush as much current as you possibly could imagine, they'll outrush it, but they're very delicate in their charge cycles, the environment that you have to have them in, like that Vectron setup that I was talking about that I did for my friend, that has, that has to stay above, what, I think 40 degrees at all times. Because the battery sees below 40 degrees, it's, it's junk. If you discharge it below like 14.2 volts, which is fully discharged, junk kind of thing. I think those are the specs. Off the top of my head, I'd have to go look. So nobody quote me on that out there in video, man. But uh, hot ground, hot ground. And this is where our uh, RG393 is going to go. It's going to pop out this hole. But I think we're going to be coming back to that and I think phase two. I think our main goal today is to get battery cap um alternator took all day yesterday <laughs> right. should take like two hours took all day yesterday <laughs> screwing around with a stupid regulator but we're at 15 1 rock solid at the alternator the dash reads 14 9 and back here it's going to volt out at about 14 9 so underneath the load 
internally inside the box because there's so many losses between all the different connections internally under operation it'll probably drop to about 14 volts which is perfect you gotta figure you're gonna have about a volt maybe a volt and a half worth of loss over this distance even if we ran heavy heavy wire now the next question everybody's gonna say but why didn't you run like four odd it's not necessary we can only you can run four out cable I'm not saying we couldn't have but there's no point if the biggest alternator that we can get to go to your stock pad mount location is that little 350 amp alternator but it's continuous it's another thing i had a guy on facebook go you need to go look at mechman told me you need to go look at mechman alternators okay so there's multiple different kinds of alternators in this universe Seven and a half years ago, nobody had heard about McMahon, and here I was installing 370 and 400 amp alternators and little Chevy trucks and shit. Mm -hmm. I know all about McMahon. It works great for an on-road vehicle. It doesn't work great for a continuous generation setup. That's the reason that we need the bigger stator, the bigger armature, the bigger alternator, more cooling. It... Let me also say this about Lease Neville. It would not kill them to go and design a new alternator to replace the ones they have been producing for it seems like the last hundred years that alternator that's underneath your hood was designed in the 50s with the slide roll and there are way better alternators that put out way more current that are produced today but they don't mount up to that pad location and they're not in that same price range but we had to get off the 168 amp alternator and go to a three i would love to see two of those alternators underneath the hood or we go get a really big Lexadyne and bolt it up underneath there but now you're talking thousands upon thousands and thousands of dollars the coolest one on the market right now which a lot of you guys don't know about but think mechman's a shit mechman is pretty nice don't get me wrong i'm a big pro mechman guy is the cruxus made by a company called itt and it's not the uh international institute of technology it's a whole nother subdivision that they just build stuff for the government there is a alternator. Um, you guys might be familiar with it. Those of you that know uh, Arland over at X-Force, that alternator that he had underneath the hood of his truck um, is actually a felony to own. It's a tier one operation only alternator. So it means he bought it someplace from some government contractor that bought it from ITT. That thing will produce at a 500 RPM, 1000 amps, idle. It's got six different phases in it, so you can do almost anything you want with it. You can use it to run an AC box, you can use it to run, it's a variable voltage, variable field, variable all kinds of crap. It's like the alternator wet dream, but it's for government and military use only. It's made by Cruxus, the ITT Cruxus. Go Google it, it'll blow your mind. It's on a whole nother page. Now, on top of that, um, with electric cars getting to the way they are now, um, there are gen units that you can go buy now that produce like 2,000 amps that we can mount in a direct fly configuration off the flywheel on the motor. The ability to make the currents there, it's the financial restraint of the install. But this is what we're working with today. I can't seem to find people that want to go and really spend the money on the bigger, different batteries, but we're going to make do with what we got, and we're going to show you what we have, and it's going to work perfect. So on that note, we got to move forward, run out of sunlight, and it's finally stopped snowing. Okay, so everybody wants to know about the reason why or wants to know about the meters where they're going to go. I don't know about you. Here, we'll pretend we're sitting at the driver's eye line here. As we're running down the road, I want to be able to see everything that's going on all the time. Not just out the window, but, I mean, everything all the time. You have three stages of amplification that are taking place between your radio and, let's say, the antenna out here. You have your radio to the driver, which now every day, everybody, common thing today is to have a 100, 200 watt radio, right? So that means the 30 watt, 40 watt, very relatively safe, um, don't have to worry about it, SWR joint between the radio and your driver has to be monitored. So you have a reflect, now I, I read right to left, I don't know about you. Same here. Okay, I mean we, we might be born on Romulan where they read right to left, or, or pardon me, lead le left to right, but or Chinese where they lead left or right or vertical depending on the situation vertical or horizontal top to bottom bottom to top i think of rf flowing in one direction so it's very confusing to me when i see people and they're like yeah so over here's my final output and then like here's my radio and then over here is my 
you know, driver and it's all scattered. These are all my reflect meters and then that's my forward meter. I can't think like that. I want to think these two meters here is reflect forward because remember power is moving this direction and getting bigger as we go. This is our reflect and forward from our radio to our driver. And then I reflect and I forward from the driver to the big box and then I reflect from the antenna and then forward from the antenna. So putting out more power going right to left. Now he's been getting by down here. He's got himself an inline LP 100, but this works great when you've only got one stage. It's time to go to big boy club. Mm -hmm. Also up in here, I want to do, I was thinking somewhere up in here, somewhere across the top, we're going to do your stage switches to bring on your driver and bring on the big box. Make it all in one unit. But as he's driving down a road, jaw jacking on his derail radio, and by the way, check out derail's channel. It's really cool, called derail radio. As he's jaw jacking on his derail radio, he can literally not have to take his eyes off the road between his pad his navigation system, his phone, the partridge in a pear tree, he can look straight out and see what's going on with his system. And I can't tell you how many times in my own personal experience, like when I had the 64 pill in my truck, I'd have a problem with the driver. If I only had a forward and a reflex meter on my final stage, it just tells me that there's a problem. It doesn't tell me where. Or if you've got this set up, you can go, oh, it's my radio, or oh, it's my driver, or it's at the final box, because I got my drive going in, but now my reflect at my my driver's gone up or oh there's a problem with my coax or something's wrong with the driver because now my reflect from my radio has gone up the power's going in but nothing's coming out of my driver and you can see it on the fly all the time hence the reason for the 1.2 million different colors and the ability to dim it because this is going to be right in your eyesight line of sight which i think is going to be sexy i can't wait to stick some bbi stickers up back behind that that look cool. All right, let's get back to work. Enough time talking. Let's go back to work. Well, here we are from uh, the frozen butthole of Hoth, seven million degrees below zero, and uh, we just got the super capacitor mounted permanently, and uh, got our positive and negative wires run. So, um. Thing with super caps is you got to make sure they're fully charged like you know we took this out of a fully charged setup and uh, we got to mount it charged and then hook it to the electrical system you don't ever hook one of these up with no current in them and we're going to continue on and i'm going to show you that the last thing that you want to have touching your charge lead is the super cap so if we end up adding a battery or something you have to take that positive lead and run it over to the battery and then bring it in line. But there's enough room for us to put probably a whole nother cap in here plus the 24 pill. But since I got a 32 out there running on three super caps in a single 300 amp alternator, I don't think we're gonna have any problems. But uh, we could have another whole long conversation about the downside of lead acid batteries and how they pull 30 or 40 amps per battery to push them up to 14, above 14 volts per battery, but we're not gonna have that. I want to go play. I want you to see how it changes the characteristics of just the truck starting by us adding this cap. I think you're going to be impressed. So, away we go. Let you know when it's set? Okay. So we're going to run an experiment. Now the cap is not in the optimal place for this. If we wanted the cap to be in the best place, we'd put it down here in a battery banker as close to the starter as possible. But we're going to run a little test. I'm going to have him fire up his truck and we're going to see how long it takes for the starter and the this the sound of the starter being able to flip the motor over. Go ahead and hit it, brother. Here we go. Okay, so that's what it sounds like without a supercapacitor in the circuit. I'm very interested to see what difference it's going to make. We got to do it. You got to do the same process, otherwise it invalidates the data. So we're sitting at 13, 12.99. Go ahead and kick the key over. And start it when you're ready. 
I doubt this is going to make that big of a difference, but we'll see. Interesting to see the charge process. Okay, so we just shut it off. We're idling at 15.12. Go ahead and start it whenever you're ready, Alex. I want you guys to see the difference. Listen to how fast this thing's starting now. Pretty, I think. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, it looks sexy. So, awesome. we've got our uh, 1500 farad super cap, our 24 pill. All the eyelets are crimped and soldered and looks sexy. Maybe tomorrow we can get that inverter installed. Uh, Alex spent big boy money and got himself pure, pure, pure. Uh, eaten inverters I'm telling you Alex those things are the shit I got four of these now I love them they don't make any kind of noise, noise yeah that's what I'm concerning about and uh, they rate that I don't know what they rate that one at what 1500 or five or a thousand watts or something mm -hmm. it's like it's three times that I swear it's an amazing unit but Let's get out of here, dude. I'm tired of being cold. I know you're tired of being cold. Let's get your truck put, put back together and uh, let's get some of those other projects out of here. Pull the meters and stuff. But I think that turned out, turned out pretty good. You happy? Yep, I am. Okay. 100%. Let's do it. You know, Alex, for about five years, this is how I shot every YouTube video. My little trusty 4K handy cam in hand. And I used to be able to fly it around a bench and show all kinds of stuff to people. It would always stay in focus, and I wasn't cussing at it, and it didn't have to sit up on a tripod to be badass. So, we're at the end of this song and dance, this story, boys and girls. 
I got his truck all set up, super capacitor installed, 24 pill installed. Um, we got to take a pause for the cause on this. We ran out of time and uh, we decided that we we're going to put his antenna in a different location on his truck. And I can't wait to show you that in part two. But this has been a fun, about two and a half days we've worked on this. Two and a half days, yeah. And a lot of time was wasted on an alternator though. We would have probably been done last night if we hadn't played with our nipples so long on that freaking alternator, but these meters are all done, they're all labeled, everything's hooked up, everything's tested, and um, he's got a current system running in his truck at the moment, so we're going to hold off installing these finally, probably for what, maybe another couple weeks, it's probably going to be a month or better, yeah, yeah, that'll give me time to get the, the puck mounted, the plates mounted, we're going to use this tugboat grounding strap here. Because, I mean, if you're going to ground something, ground something. I got some of this wire from my buddy Mr. P down there in your town, believe it or not. My good friend Paul, I love him. He's a great guy. He's just one of these people that's so full of energy that for about two days around him, I'm exhausted to the point where it's like I can't keep up no more, you know. That looks sexy. It's going to look great up on your dash, dude. I that best meter setup I've seen in the mobile, short of like an LP700 or LP500, you know. Well, guys, I appreciate you tuning in, follow along, and watching us do this install. It's been a lot of fun. Um, hopefully, you guys can pick up some tips and some tricks from this video. That was the whole point behind shooting it. So, on that note, we're going to run away now. We're going to run away off to do other things. Big shout out to Siglent, big shout out to Excess Power, and once again, big thanks to all of you guys. If you like what you've seen, make sure to subscribe. There's always more shit like this coming out. Give me a thumbs up if you get the chance. I'll see you guys. Bye.